Now tonight we're speaking about freedom from the Verma Pact. Um, Islam offers two kinds of submission to the world. One is the submission of, the, of conversion to become a Muslim and to live under the conditions determined by the Shahada, which is a commitment to accept Muhammad as the messenger of Allah and his, his preaching and the, his meaning of his preaching that there's no God but Allah. But there's another alternative which was not offered to everyone but it was offered to Christians and Jews. It is offered to Christians and Jews under Islamic law and that is to surrender to the political power of Islam while you're keeping your faith but subject to very significant conditions that restrict your life. And that's what I'll be speaking about today and explaining why these conditions are really important for the church to understand. What does it mean to be a non-Muslim living under Islamic conditions, under Sharia conditions. What does it mean to be one of the conquered multitudes who in history have come under Islamic rule? How are these conditions determined? Why is it so? Why does this system exist? And what relevance might this have for us here uh, in the United States at this time? Well, it actually all goes back to Muhammad's treatment of the Jews. When he moved to Medina, he set up the beginnings of the Islamic State and he found that the Jews were not willing to accept his teaching. And he, he told them that they were being deceptive, they really knew he was a prophet and they were lying about it. Um, and he began to expel the tribes with increasing severity until the last tribe, the Bani Qurayza that was left, they surrendered to Muhammad's forces and he had all the men beheaded and the women and children were enslaved. In fact, Muhammad picked up a concubine, a sex slave, from one of the Jewish women at that time. And after that, his forces turned against um, an oasis, in, which is now in Saudi Arabia, called Khaybar. And this was mainly inhabited by Jews. Muhammad takes his army against them and attacks them. They're told to embrace Islam. They fight. Many are enslaved and killed. Muhammad picks up another Jewish um, a woman at that time, uh, the wife of one of the leaders of the Jews. Um, and uh, some other Jews surrender, and they're allowed to keep their faith and also their, their, their property, and they surrender according to a pact. So they keep their religion. This is the first time that people are allowed to live under Islam, not as Muslims. And this event becomes the foundation in Islamic law for the whole system that applies in Islam for non-Muslims living under Islamic law. It's a very important event. And the pact that they surrendered to is known as the Dhimma Pact, and I'll be explaining what that means and the implication of that. For them, at that time, it meant they would pay half of their, their harvest to, to the Muslims in order to be able to keep their religion and their property. So the Dhimma Pact, the word Dhimma is an Arabic word. It means to blame or find fault with. And it's the opposite of praise. So out of that word meaning to blame comes a, a word meaning a covenant of blame. And it, its meaning is that if you don't keep this covenant, you'd be under a penalty. So there's a threat involved in this idea of a them a pact. It could be translated as a pact of liability or a, a risky pact, if you like, because if you break it, you're in deep trouble. This pact of surrender that the Jews of Khaybar entered into involved submission to the Muslims, it was for the people of the book only in Islamic law, so not available to pagan uh, Arabs uh, and to idol worshippers in general. Um, converts to Islam were free from these rules. So one way to escape the pact is to become a Muslim. And it fixes the legal, social, political role of Christians and Jews and some others too living under Islam for centuries and centuries. It becomes the framework in which um, non-Muslims exist under Islamic rule. There is a verse in the Quran which is considered to be the authority or the basis for this system, which is Surah 929. Fight against those who've been given the scripture, that's Jews and Christians, as who do not believe in Allah nor the last day and don't forbid what Allah has forbidden by the messenger. So Jews and Christians don't follow Muhammad's instructions for what's right and wrong. So they fit into this category. They don't follow the religion of truth, which is Islam. Fight against them, and the word in Arabic fight means to kill until they pay the tribute, which is jizya, readily being humiliated or made small, the Arabic says. So after surrender, there are two aspects. One is tribute payments and other taxes as well. And, and the other is humiliation, being made small. And I'm going to unpack those two concepts. What does it mean to be paying that tribute and the symbolism of it? And what does it mean to be made small? 
So dhimmi status, to be a, a person living under this pact, you're known as a dhimmi. And this is a perpetual status that lasts from generation to generation. Actually, in Islamic law, it's said that it lasts until Isa returns, Jesus, and Jesus will impo impose Islamic Sharia law on the whole world. And at that point, all the Christians must convert to Islam or die at the sword of Jesus. So Jesus is actually the destroyer of Christianity in Islamic eschatology in end times. But anyway, it lasts until then. And it goes from generation to generation. It's tied to jihad, it's a concession which allows Jews and Christians to keep their religion after jihad, providing they continue to compensate the Muslims. And there are alternatives. It's considered to have been a choice. So you could convert to Islam. You could uh, opt for the sword, which is either you win against the Muslims or you get killed and enslaved, or you can run away. You can flee. So you've got some choices in this situation. It's a choice. Adhimi is someone then who's not a Muslim, living under Islamic rule and subject to a Dhimma pact. In fact, historically in Islamic law, if you were not a Muslim living in an Islamic society permanently, you had to have this status. There was no other provision for you other than this status. Now the jizya head tax, this is the tax that's paid. Actually it's paid by every adult Dhimmi male. And it comes from a verb which means to give satisfaction or compensation. It means giving a satisfaction or a compensation to the Muslims for something. But for what? Um, Muslim lexicographers, people who wrote dictionaries, defined it as it is the tax that's taken from the free non-Muslim of a Muslim government whereby they ratify the, the compact, the covenant, the dhimma, that ensures them protection as though it were a compensation for their not being slain. How is it that not being killed needs to be compensated for? Well, it's actually understandable because you've been attacked by Muslims and they would take your wives as their slaves and your children as their slaves, they take your property and because you've surrendered, you have to compensate for them for that because they're missing out quite badly by not taking everything you have. So the jizya is a tribute to compensate them for not having absolute victory. You compensate them for withdrawing from fighting. Um, why am I confident that that's the case? I spent a lot of effort looking through many commentaries, Islamic sources, historical texts, and particularly on Surah 929, looked at more than 80 Arabic commentaries uh, on 929. So um, Atfayish, who was a, a, an Algerian commentator in the 19th century, writing on this verse, 929, he said, the jizya is a satisfaction for their blood. It is said that it has sufficed to compensate for their not being killed or slain. Its purpose is to substitute for the wajib, the duty of killing and of slavery. So what he's saying is that Muslims have a wajib, it's compulsory duty to kill and enslave non-Muslims, but they can be compensated for not fulfilling this duty by being paid jizya, by being paid the money. It's for the benefit of Muslims. It's not a universal tax to help everybody in the state. Uh, to understand the nature of the jizya and its spiritual meaning, it's very helpful to look at the ritual that was imposed for the jizya payment. And there are a number of descriptions of this ritual that stretch back into the 9th century. And this is a description from Morocco in the, uh, around about the 15th century. On the day of the payment, the dhimmis will be assembled in a public place. We've got to keep going. Assembled in a public place. They should be standing there waiting in the lowest and the dirtiest place. So they'll be humiliated. The acting officials representing the law, that is Islamic law, shall be placed above them in a higher position and adopt a threatening attitude so that it seems to the dhimmis, the Jews or the Christians, as well as to everyone else, the people watching, that our object or our purpose is to degrade them by pretending to take their possessions. That is, it should look as though we're about to loot them. And then they will realize that we're doing them a favor in accepting the tribute from them and letting them go free. Then they'll each be dragged one by one for the exacting of payment and when paying the dhimmi will receive a blow, it's actually a blow on the neck, a symbolic decapitation. And they'll be thrown aside so that they'll think they've escaped the sword through this. This is the way that the friends of Muhammad, of the first and last generations, will act towards their infidel enemies, for might belongs to Allah, to his apostle, and to all the believers. So that's a description of the ritual of the payment of the jizya from the 15th century. 
And we also have descriptions, there was an American ship's captain by the name of Riley who was uh, shipwrecked in, in uh, Morocco in the early 19th century who describes this ritual and a Jewish visitor in the end of the 19th century. So you have to understand that this ritual has been going for more than a thousand years in Morocco. By this time there's no more Christians left, it's only Jews paying uh, the jizya. Imagine if when the Normans conquered England, the Anglo-Saxons, in 1066, instead of merging with the conquered peoples, they kept them separate. And every year the Anglo-Saxons had to line up on every village green and pay a tax and be ritually stabbed in the heart to show that they were escaping their life through this. And imagine that this is still happening in England today and it will happen for another 400 years before it stops. And it only stops because England is invaded. And this is what happened in Morocco. This, this is the time period we're speaking about. And it stopped because of the interference of the European powers, but I'll come on to that later. So there's lots and lots of Islamic textbooks that describe this ritual, this payment ritual, and it's good to study them to find out exactly what it means. Some say the dhimmi must come to the place of payment walking, not riding, so in an inferior position. He would make the payment standing when the receiver is seated to show the greater authority of the receiver. The dhimmi is shaken violently and made to become agitated as part of the ritual. The Muslim could have a whip in his hand. He's ordered to pay the tax even though that's what he's already doing. He's beaten up, roughed up. Some say that he's dragged by the throat using clothes pulled around the throat or a rope around the neck as you drag a captive away to be enchained or to be beheaded. He's struck on the back of the neck. He's struck on the side of the neck. These are the two ways to behead someone. Either a very strong blow to the back of the neck or cut someone's throat. He's pulled along by the beard. Again, a gesture that's used as part of decapitation. He has dirt on his head, so his head is thrown to the ground. A Muslim might put his foot on the dhimmi's neck. So these are all descriptions taken from Islamic legal textbooks describing the interpretation of Surah 929. And I was wondering as I was doing this research, and looking at all these commentaries, maybe it's just an exception. Maybe it only happened in a few places. Maybe the norm was beautiful and everyone was living happily together. And as I looked, I found descriptions from the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th century, um, going into the 6th, 17th, 18th, 19th, even into the 20th century, and from places all over the Muslim world, from Central Asia to North Africa, in Yemen. In fact, the last references before just the very recent troubles to the jizya payment rituals were in Afghanistan in the 1950s. They are very, very widespread practice. It's also interesting to consider what Muslim jurists and writers have said about the psychological meaning of the ritual. I found this very moving description by a Moroccan jurist uh, writing in the 18th century. He said that Vimy is commanded to put his soul, good fortune and desires to death. Above all, he should kill the love of life, leadership and honour. The dhimmi is to invert the longings of his soul. He is to load his soul down more heavily than it can bear until it's completely submissive. Thereafter, nothing will be unbearable for him. He will be indifferent to subjugation or might. Poverty and wealth will be the same. Praise and insult will be the same. Preventing and yielding will be the same. Lost and found will be the same. And then when all things are the same, the soul of the dhimmi will be submissive and yield willingly what it should give. So what he's explaining is that the intention of this ritual is that the dhimmi would be completely broken in his spirit so that if something is demanded of him, he will give it instantly without any resistance whatsoever. Riley, that American ship's captain, when he visited Morocco, was shocked to discover that it was just completely customary for Muslim men to go into the Jewish quarters and rape Jewish women. There was no, no, no sanction, there was no consequence, it was just a normal part of life there in, in, the, uh, in the Jewish quarters um, in, in Morocco at that time. So that's a symptom, they would yield willingly what they're supposed to give. Now this is a commentary by Ibn Kathir. It's very widely used as an English translation of a, of a notable Muslim commentary. And it's his comments on 929. You can look this up yourself on the internet. He, under the heading of, uh, of paying jizya is, is a sign of kufr and disgrace, 
uh, he writes about 929. He said, Allah said, he's quoting from the verse, until they pay the jizya, that is if they do not choose to embrace Islam, with willing submission, that is in defeat and subservience, and feel themselves subdued, that is he explains, this means they should be disgraced, humiliated and belittled. Therefore, Muslims are not allowed to honor the people of the Dhimma or elevate them above Muslims, for they are miserable, disgraced, and humiliated. And then he quotes um, a Muslim, this is the collection of hadiths by Muslim. He recorded from Abu Huraira that the Prophet said, do not initiate the salam to Jews and Christians, so don't bless them. And if you meet them in the road, force them to its narrowest alley, push them out of the, out of the way. This is why the leader of the faithful, and then he quotes from the Caliph, may Allah be pleased with him, he demanded that his well-known conditions be met by the Christians, these conditions that ensured the continued humiliation, degradation, and disgrace. And here, Ibn Kathir is referring to an early example of a Dhimma pact, which is believed to be, uh, have been instituted in Syria uh, for the Christians in the, in the first Islamic century. So what are these regulations that he speaks about, these conditions that ensures their continued humiliation, degradation and disgrace? Well, these are all the principles in Islamic law that apply to them, is to non-Muslims living under Islam. So I'm just going to run through them. Under Islam, any Muslim who converts to Christianity or even to Judaism is subject to the death penalty. Conversions between other faiths are not permitted. The only kind of conversion that's permitted is to Islam. It's forbidden to try and convert a Muslim from their faith. These are all the conditions of the surrender of the pact. It's forbidden to hinder a fellow Dhimmi from entering Islam. A Muslim man can marry a Christian or a Jewish woman and their children are Muslims under law. It's forbidden for a Muslim woman to marry a Christian or a Jewish man. Anyone who converts to Islam could gain preferential inheritance rights within their family. They could inherit the family's property and a spouse who converts would gain sole guardianship of the children who'd be considered Muslims as well. No new churches are allowed to be built after conquest and any damaged churches are not permitted to be repaired after conquest. Dhimmi houses have to be smaller and lower than Muslim houses. If you visit the Jewish quarters in some of those old Islamic cities in Spain, you'll see they're very small houses. Uh, uh, you can still see that to this day. Dhimmis also had to dress differently and more poorly than Muslims. There's a tradition of Muhammad that says people that look alike are the same. And if you, if you look like them, you are of them. So uh, the Mis had to be dressed differently. In the early centuries, they often wore a neck seal, a piece of lead around their neck, to show that their neck was safe for the year. They paid the jizya tribute. Uh, we have archaeologists have found examples of these seals. And later there were separate belts or a bell that they would wear, that they would show that they were different. Even in the baths where people were naked, the non-Muslims had to wear something to show that they were, they were not Muslims. Uh, Dhimmi has to move out of the way, vacate the seat for a Muslim, adopt a humble appearance. It's forbidden on pain of death or perhaps amputation for a Dhimmi to raise a hand against a Muslim. Uh, it's forbidden uh, to curse a Muslim. Dhimmis could not own or carry weapons. And that continues to be a major issue. If you're in Iraq today, you're a church and you want to protect the church, you generally employ Muslim guards with guns. To have Christians carrying guns would be considered a provocation. The blood of a Muslim is not equal to the blood of a dhimmi. So, although the murder of a Muslim is punished by death in Islamic law, Sharia law states that no Muslim can be put to death for killing a non-Muslim. Ibn Taymiyyah said, Jews and Christians don't believe in Muhammad, so their blood and a Muslim's blood are not the same. And in Saudi Arabia today, there's values, uh, money values for every different kind of believer. And there's a high value for a Muslim man, less for a Muslim woman. Down it goes. Christians are worth something. Hindus are pretty low. There's a value on blood. And so the value of blood is not the same. If a dhimmi kills another dhimmi and then converts to Islam, he or she would escape punishment. Anyone who converts to Islam that way is let off from a death sentence. Christians are not allowed to hold public office or exercise authority over Muslims. Um, that's why as Islam has risen again in Egypt, Christians have been disappearing from senior positions. Boutros, Boutros Ghali was the foreign minister of Egypt at one point. He became the head of the UN. That would not happen anymore in Egypt because uh, as, as Islam has been rising, so these sorts of conditions have been coming back into countries that had become more liberal. The me testimony is not valid against a Muslim in an Islamic court. This principle applies all throughout the Islamic world and it means that Christians are very vulnerable. So if your Muslim neighbor accuses you of something, 
your testimony is not valid against him. So that means that Christians live in a permanent state of vulnerability to any kind of ill will that might be directed against them. And it also tends to corrupt Christians because they have to bribe Muslims to be there to give evidence on their behalf if they have the misfortune of being taken to court. The Dhimmis have to had to house and feed Muslim soldiers in the original framework of the Dhimma Pacts. They had to help the Jihad. They're forbidden from any public display of their religion, no crosses, no funeral processions, no bells, no loud singing. If you look at photographs of, of Jerusalem from the late 19th century, the churches have no crosses on them. And when Hamas took over in uh, Gaza, they banned the bells. The bells fell silent in the Christian churches. Um, Dhimmis are forbidden from teaching their children about Islam. That's really interesting. This whole system is not meant to be understood. It's meant to be experienced, but not analyzed. Dhimmis are not allowed to ride horses because it would raise their heads above those of Muslims. In many areas, Dhimmis were required to wear these colored patches on their clothes. So just an example, this is from, um, from Spain, the Golden Age. The Qadi uh, uh, Ahmad bin Talib, uh, he compelled the Dhimmis to wear on their shoulder a patch of white cloth that bore the image of an ape for the Jews, a pig for the Christians, and to nail onto their doors a board bearing, bearing the sign of a monkey. Another uh, commentator said a distinctive sign must be imposed upon them in order that they may be recognized and this will be for them a form of disgrace. So this system made sure that Christians were always instantly recognized so they could be treated poorly. Uh, and um, someone has written, uh, someone called Bat Yor has written about what she calls the mimetic tendency, which is the tendency for Christians to want to, to merge into the Ummah and not to be distinguishable from it, to look like Muslims in order to be safe. Um, there are also manifestations of this whole system um, which, manifestation of this whole system which, although not part of the Islamic law, become abuses that are very common. So, for example, uh, Muslim children throwing stones at non-Muslims, widely reported in Palestine, for example, in the 19th century. When Palestinian children throw stones at the Israelis, at the, at the army, this has a long history, this, this particular act. You are my dhimmi. Um, cursing of Jews and Christians is also part of this. Uh, Lane did an ethnography of Egypt. He wrote about Egypt in the middle of the 19th century. He said, I'm credibly informed that children in Egypt are often taught at school a regular set of curses to denounce upon the persons and property of Christians, Jews, and all other unbelievers in the religion of Muhammad. And in his book, he gives a list of the curses. And the curses are basically, may their dhimma be set aside, may they be killed, may their property be taken, may their wives be enslaved. So it's a curse that the dhimma will not, not protect them and they'll be subject to the jihad. Other practices in Yemen, uh, orphaned Jewish children had to be handed over to be raised as Muslims. Uh, the, the Turks had the system of the Janissaries where they would take a tribute of children from Christians and forcibly convert them to Islam and use them as, as slave soldiers, the Janissaries. And then they used these slave soldiers to fight against Christians and to advance the borders of the Turkish Empire. Uh, the, the Islamic State has done this with, with Christian children and turned them into jihadi fighters. They call them cubs of the caliphate. Now, there's something else to understand about this. In the Pact of Umar, these early conditions that uh, were, were referred to by Ibn Kathir, there's a paragraph at the end where the Christians say that we've set out these, these conditions against ourselves as part of our dhimma, our pact. And if we break any of these promises that we've set out for your benefit, then our dhimma is broken and you're allowed to do with us what you're allowed to do with people of defiance and rebellion. Basically they're saying, if we don't toe the line perfectly, the jihad restarts and we accept that as part of the condition of our surrender. And what does that mean? Well, it means that, um, it means death and it means rape and it means looting. There's a number of references to this in the literature. For example, William Eaton, did a survey of the Turkish Empire in 1799. And he said the words of their formulary, this is the, the, the words that are said to Christians, given to Christian subjects on their paying the, the head tax, mean, import, they mean that the sum of money received is taken as compensation for being permitted to wear their heads for that year ahead. So they have to pay the money. If they don't, they would lose their head. Um, this is al Mawardi uh, writing in 1058, or he died in 1058, so just before then. 
he's writing about the conditions of the Dhimma. He says they make a payment every year and this is an ongoing tribute by which their security is established. It's not permitted to resume the jihad against them as long as they make the payments. If they refuse to make the payment, however, the reconciliation ceases, their security is no longer guaranteed, and war must be waged on them like any other persons from the enemy's camp. So the payment of the tribute is a temporary cessation of war until you have to pay it again the next year. What this means is that Christian communities under Islam live under the constant threat of war breaking out against them from generation to generation through the centuries. Ibn Qudama said that a protected person, a dhimmi, who violates his, his, his dhimma, whether by refusing to pay the tribute or to submit to the laws of the community, that is of Islamic law, makes his person and his goods halal. Their blood becomes halal. That means if a Muslim kills them, it's not a crime. There's no compensation needed. So they actually have no protection at all in law if they violate their protection pact. Quite the contrary. So the consequence of violating a pact, breaking the pact, could result in uh, looting, rape and enslavement for women and children and death for the men. And it's also been described that by some commentators or some jurists that if one person in the community breaks the pact, the whole community's pact is taken away. So it's a communal pact and if, if someone steps out of line there's a communal punishment. The concept of collective punishment is widely adhered to by Muslims in many places. If one person does something that's considered out of line, the whole village can suffer very much. So this is, this is part of the mentality. This increases the sense of vulnerability. Examples. The Jews in Granada were massacred in 1066. Why did that happen? Because the Sultan appointed a Jew as a Grand Vizier. He was leading the city. And Islamic law says that Jews cannot have authority over Muslims. So this caused Muslim clerics in the mosque to be angry and to say the Jews are rising too much. And the result was a rising up against the Jews and they were killed. So this was the action of the Sultan promoting a Jew above what Islamic law applied, which made the Jews vulnerable, and that was the death of them. Christians in Damascus also suffered a, a great massacre as well. And the reasons for that was that the, the great powers of Europe put pressure on the Turks to improve the conditions of Christians because they were helping the Turks against the Russians in their jihad against the Russians. And um, so the Dhimma was technically lifted across the Turkish Empire. And the result of that was that Christians began to do better. They began to ride horses or they didn't pay their taxes and they didn't pay the jizya. They were no longer humiliated. And then the preachers in the mosque began to say, look at these Christians, they're not protected anymore. They're not paying the jizya, they're not humiliated. They're, they're rising up, they, they, they have no protection. And so the people rose up and they killed them and they enslaved the women and children. It was a, it was a very, a very serious uh, event. So um, this again, it's not their fault that they were, they were made to be equal in the law with Muslims, but it has destroyed their security. Um, there were uh, also another phenomenon is abduction of women and tolerance of attacks on non-Muslim women. In, in all the communities, um, there is a, a constant background of, of assaults against women. It's a huge issue in Egypt today. If you have a really beautiful daughter, you might try and get her out of the country because she's at risk. And women are constantly being abducted, forcibly married. Um, their, their cross is taken off and sometimes they, they, they have tattooed on their wrist taken off in government funded clinics. Um, their husband then becomes their guardian. He's the one who speaks on their behalf and they get lost. And uh, it's, a huge, it's a huge issue in Egypt. But I found in community after community after community, this is an issue. It's an issue in, in Pakistan for Christian women. It's actually an issue in the UK. There's been story after story about these rape gangs that have been basically raping and, and trafficking in poor white uh, working class girls. And it's just been shocking for the UK. And again and again, the police have not intervened because they're worried about being called racist. The numbers of victims number in the 10,000s. But what's happening is that if you live under this system, then you have this idea that Christians could be fair game if they step out of line. They could be lawfully raped. And that creates a culture of rape. And it creates huge problems. We've had cases in Sydney, in Australia, where um, there was more than 60 victims of these rape gangs that um, Lebanese Muslim boys had been involved in. Horrific, horrific accounts. Uh, in Sweden, uh, a very disproportionate number of the rapists in jail are, are Muslims. I'm not saying this to incite hatred against Muslims, that's not the case. Uh, actually, if anything, I'd like to evoke compassion to understand what it means to be a Christian living under Islam 
for more than a thousand years and the history of that and the depth of what that would do to people's souls over a long period of time. And the problem is the legal structure of Islam that's the hidden explanation for these social patterns that are so dysfunctional. In Taiba, a Palestinian village in September 2005, the word had got about that a, 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 a Christian man had a relationship with a Muslim woman. This is unacceptable under the Dhimma system. There was a riot. The Muslims were crying, Allahu Akbar. They were looting the stores. People said it was like a jihad. But it was a punishment on the whole community because uh, one person s stepped out of line. Um, similar issues in Egypt, um, a mob of over 4,000 Muslims attacked Coptic homes and burnt down a church uh, in, near, near Cairo. Why did they do that? Because the, the church was planning to renovate its facilities. And remember, you're not allowed to repair a church after conquest. So just even fixing your latrine or doing some modification to a church in Egypt could be considered to be an incredibly provocative act and therefore withdraw the protection that you have as a community. The Muslim Brotherhood attacked Coptic churches in 2012 because they claimed that the Copts had not been loyal, they didn't kind of support them uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in their situation there. Um, I think I'm going, I need to keep in, in sync. So I want to introduce a concept to you, having kind of pushed all this upon you. Um, that is of dhimitude, which is the psychological condition which is generated by these, these conditions, these conditions of Islamic law. Just as in the United States, slavery may be abolished, but racism can continue after it's abolished. So the dhimma might be abolished in law, but the attitude that Christians should be inferior and uh, you know, humble and servile, this can continue on for a very long time in societies in which there's no more jizya being paid. The effects of the dhimma can be very deep and last for a long time. I mean, even in today, that societies that were under this, it's very rude to hit someone on the neck. To strike a, you know, a Greek or Egyptian on the neck is considered to be very insulting because it goes back to this, this there's a sort of memory of, of what, it, what it actually meant. What is the psychology? How did you describe the situation of living as a non-Muslim under Islamic law? Well, Mawardi was writing about this and he said the jizya is either a sign of contempt because of their unbelief or it's a sign of the mildness of the Muslims. If you flip that around, what that means is that humility, feeling humiliated and humble and gratitude are the two kind of attitudes that are required of Christians living under Islam. You should be humble and you should be grateful and you should show that. And you should, if you do that, then you, you're obviously in the right place. You have the right attitude. Batyor is an um, Egyptian Jew and uh, She's now a British citizen, but she wrote extensively about this history. She wanted to understand the history of her people in Egypt. And she describes the psychological impact. She says the law, Islamic law required from them is a humble demeanor, eyes lowered, a hurried pace. They had to give way to Muslims in the street, remain standing in their presence, keep silent, only speaking when given permission. They were forbidden to defend themselves if attacked or raise a hand against a Muslim on pain of having it amputated. Any criticism of the Quran or Islamic law annulled their pact. In addition, the dhimmi was duty-bound to be grateful since it was Islamic law that spared his life. The whole corpus of these practices formed an unchanging behavior pattern which was perpetuated from generation to generation for centuries. It was so deeply internalized that it escaped critical evaluation and invaded the realm of self-image, which was henceforth dominated by a conditioning in self-devaluation. This situation, determined by a corpus of precise legislation, and social behavior patterns based on prejudice and religious traditions induced the same type of mentality in all Dhimmi groups. It has four major characteristics, vulnerability, humiliation, gratitude, and alienation. I'm just reading a book um, by uh, a, a former Dutch prime minister who is a famous theologian, Koper, and in 1905, he traveled all around the Mediterranean. And he said he observed that everywhere he went, he found Christians living in in terror of Muslims rising up to kill them. He said, he said it was overwhelming terror. And it had a justification because 10 years later, the Armenian genocide happened and more than a million were killed. That terror arose out of events in the 19th century, the kind of pogroms that I've described. Um, there's a lot that you can, if you want to search this out about this, one of the most moving descriptions was a book on, on the Christians in the Palestinian controlled areas. Um, he said that, a, that one Palestinian cleric, a pastor, compared the behavior of Christian dhimmis 
under the Palestinian Authority, to that of battered wives and children, who continue to defend and even identify with their tormentor, even as the abuse persists. So one of the survival strategies when you're being oppressed like this is to identify with your abuser, and you actually become a champion of the, of the, the jihad, for example, the Palestinian jihad. You become a defender of Islam. Christians then become very keen to say how wonderful their past has been with Muslims and how they've lived together in, in golden harmony and it's been so good to work together. It was Christians that came up with the idea of, a, of an Arab identity that they could all be one together in this beautiful Arab identity. There's also some really deep challenge for Christians in these sorts of dynamics. Christ offers a model of service where we serve our neighbour which involves subjugating our own needs in the favour of another's. But Islam intend, uh, interprets this service not as grace, but as a debt owed. The service is considered to be a confirmation of Islam's destiny to rule over the people of the book. In this paradigm, aid becomes tribute and humility becomes humiliation. So just to be provocative, America has traditionally given a lot of aid to Egypt. But is it aid or tribute? That's the question, isn't it? <laughs> and what's the difference? Um, there's a lot of denial about this. You will read descriptions that are so different from what I've said. Uh, some will say that the jizya was an exemption for zakat. So Muslims paid taxes, Christians paid taxes, but actually the jizya was often ten times what Muslims paid. They say it's just a tax like any other tax, but it's not. Some say it was a compensation. Remember, it means compensation, jizya means, uh, for, for, for not being involved in military service. Actually, it was a compensation for not losing your head. Some say it was a payment of protection, and Vimma means pact of protection, but actually it means pact of risk, pact of liability. Some say it was a light tax, but actually it was a very heavy tax. And these sorts of lies are very widespread. Now, what's been interesting is that this denial about the history has become embedded in Western consciousness. It's part of textbooks that are used in schools. It's become part of the rhetoric of politicians. And the, the kind of vimy worldview, the vimitude, if you like, has become, is becoming promulgated within Western societies. So when after the 9-11 attack, George Bush stands up and says, true Islam is nonviolent and that it's a religion of peace, this is a very characteristic vimy response after, after attack. Um, the Taliban had some rough words to say about that. I'm astonished. Is he a scholar of Islam? Has he ever read the Quran? Um, this is a really interesting incident that's reported by Patrick Sukdeo, an Anglican minister. In South London, Muslim gangs armed with guns had targeted Christi Christians saying if they didn't convert, they'd be killed. In Bradford, a Christian family converted from Islam, had their lives threatened, their car was burnt, and they were threatened with violence. The B Bishop of Bradford met with the family with his interfaith advisor, and at the meeting, he stated that the diocese of the Anglican Church wouldn't welcome them as converts in the church. They're obviously very troubled people, troubling people, because there was so much hatred being directed against them. So he was saying, don't come to us for help. What's really striking about this is this is, hap this is what happens to Muslim converts, people from Islam into Christianity in, in the Middle East sometimes. Like if you're Egyptian, Muslim and you become a Christian and you just walk up to the front door of the church and say I've become a Christian The church might not be thrilled. They might be happy, but they might say look Can you please come around the back or please don't come here? It's actually the pact of surrender the Vimma involves a promise that you will not help people converting to Christianity You risk your own security by doing so and so it's actually quite common for Christians in the, for, for people who've come out of Islam in the Middle East to find these attitudes of fear and distancing and not being properly welcomed and not being allowed to be really fully a part of the church because the church has this deep psychological memory that goes back for generations to generations that they have to protect themselves from this situation. But what's shocking is that an English bishop would be acting like this, that he's in a way, he's drunk the cordial, he's actually coming under the Dhimma worldview without actually ever having been conquered. Yes, there have been acts of terror, there have been acts of intimidation, but they haven't been conquered, but yet they're subscribing to the worldview of the Dhimma. Mary Robinson, the former uh, president of Ireland, was the head of the Human Rights Commission at the UN, and she gave this speech. And um, it, what's interesting about this speech is that she, she expresses gratitude to Islam. 
and humility as well. So just listen for those two themes in her speech. She said it's important to recognize the greatness of Islam, its civilizations, and its immense contribution to the richness of the human experience, not only through profound belief and theology, but also through the sciences, the literature, and the art. No one can deny, notice the silencing, no criti criticism is allowed. No one can deny that at its core, Islam is entirely consonant, that means in agreement, with the principle of fundamental human rights, including human dignity, tolerance, solidarity, and equality. Numerous passages from the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad will testify to this. No one can deny from a historical perspective that the revolutionary force that is Islam, which bestowed rights on women and children long before similar recognition was afforded in other civilizations. And no one can deny the acceptance of the universality of human rights by Islamic states. It's interesting, isn't it? that you have a leader, it's a, it's a woman from a Christian country declaring that she owes her human rights as a woman to Islam. This is the theme of gratitude. And notice the silencing, no, no disagreement is permitted. There's many other examples that I could show you. Sarkozy, he said that Islam is one of the greatest and most beautiful civilizations the world has known. That's him receiving a sword from the king of Saudi Arabia. Why do they give swords to people? President Obama, we will declare our, our, our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world, yes it has, including in my own country. So he, America should be grateful for Islam's contribution to its, to its identity and its values. That is gratitude, humble gratitude is the attitude that's expected of the dhimmi mind. Actually, Churches in the West are at risk coming under this worldview, and it's a big problem. Mission agencies can come under it. You can get missionaries who are apologists for Islam. They deny all this history. They say it's a wonderful history. They've, we've all worked together well in the past, and they, they can be sucked into this. They can be ensnared by this, and it's a really serious problem. Churches can as well. Um, just to give you one example before I go into this next slide, uh, when the Muslims of the world wrote to the Christians of the world, there were a group of Christians uh, led by a team at Yale who responded and they welcomed this letter but what was really striking is they said they spoke about their incredible gratitude at receiving the letter and how humbled they were by what the Muslims had written so they were signaling gratitude and humility in the way they wrote it they thought they were being Christ-like I read it from the eyes of the Dhimmi and I said this is how the Dhimmi should behave this would be their response would be very very welcome to the Muslim writers of the letter so here we are what's the history of this institution in 1850, the Ottomans declared the equality of all peoples under the law, and there was a backlash, massacres, for example, in Damascus of the Christians, and later of the, uh, of the Armenians as well. Uh, some peoples were able to fight for their freedom, uh, the, the Greeks, the Serbs, Hungarians, some Armenians, a bit of Armenia survived, but others uh, suffered great losses in the midst of these, this battle that happened. Uh, the, the Maronites have, have, are gradually losing their freedom as, uh, as uh, Lebanon becomes increasingly Islamic majority. Uh, the Copts are, are still under the thumb of Islam. And the Assyrians suffered enormously in a genocide early in the 20th century and they've, they've copped it all over again um, in recent years in, in Iraq. And of course the Armenians uh, suffered more than a million, million casualties in a jihad to punish them for wanting to be independent. Now the other thing that's been happening is that for more than a century there's been a revival of Islam, uh, a renewal of aspiration to rule and to dominate. And alongside that the women have been putting on the veils and societies are becoming re-Islamized and countries are becoming more Islamic. So Pakistan started as a secular state then it became a Muslim state, then Sharia courts were introduced, then blasphemy against Islam was made a capital offence. And these legal changes, the movement towards stricter Islam, have been accompanied by a deterioration in the conditions of Christians. More alienation, more rapes of girls, more discrimination, and their condition has got worse and worse. So that's the trend. It's, it's, it's a result of Islam rising. It's an inevitable result of the restoration of Islam. There are also have been many calls for the jizya itself to be reinstated from Yemen, Iraq. These are examples of countries in which um, there have actually been jizya extracted from people. 
Uh, the Islamic State famously did it as well. They read the legal textbooks and they charged exactly the amount that had been described in, in thousand year old textbooks uh, upon the, the Christians of, of, uh, Syria, of Iraq and uh, of Iraq. So the newspapers were shocked to, to read, to discover and report on these events. And I was looking and I said, well, that's just to be expected. That's because this is the program. This is what's hardwired into the legal textbooks. Also, there's another issue as well, and that is that uh, Christians are persecuted under Islamic conditions around the world. Four out of five countries where Christians are persecuted today involve Muslims or Islamic motivated persecution. That's on the Open Doors watch list. So of the 50 or so countries, 40 of them are Islamic. And on the other hand, 80% of Islamic states are on that list of persecutors of Christians. Um, this is the major source of, of the wounds in the body of Christ today. Another thing that's quite important is that um, where there's actual persecution of Christians, the nature of that persecution tracks them are regulations. So restrictions on advancement in public office, restrictions on building and repairing churches. This applies even in Indonesia, for example. Kidnapping and conversion, forced marriage of women, attacks on Christians not being prosecuted, bans against witnessing, the apostasy penalties being applied either legally or extrajudicially threats of mob violence. These things are, are characteristic them are manifestations and they're the form that the persecution takes. Now, um, as I was studying this, and remember I said last night that we'd had a background, um, my wife and I, helping people coming out of witchcraft and out of uh, Satanism and other things like that. Um, I realized that this ritual, the payment of the, of the jizya, was a very powerful uh, symbolism, a, symbolism, a symbolic death. And this is often used in occult groups. You, you put someone in a coffin or there's a ritual stabbing in the heart or something like that. Cross my heart and hope to die, as, as the saying says in English, um, that in kids kind of um, language. Um, the, uh, this is a curse, it's a very powerful curse. May I be killed if I break any of these rules or you will be killed. And as I was thinking about the power of ritual to bind the human spirit and to symbolize that, I realized that a, a spiritual solution was needed to set people free. And I began to teach about this. And as I was doing that, I developed prayers, or you might say ministry strategy for setting people free from the curses of the Dhamma and the, the heritage of the Dhamma. And let me tell you, this is part of America's history too. Because in the early 19th century, the United States was paying 10% of its gross revenues to the Barbary states in North Africa, and they called that jizya, the Barbary states. It was tribute paid, why? So that the Barbary states wouldn't kidnap American crews and sell them as slaves. The Barbary states sold more than a million white slaves that they'd taken from Europe over, over centuries, and the Europeans were all paying huge tributes to them in order to prevent this trade from happening. And the Americans were, um, were, were caught in the position where they're paying 10% of their whole product, uh, national income of the, of the government. And um, uh, it's because of that that America actually started its navy. <laughs> so Americans historically are tribute payers as well. This is your history too. This is your history too. So I, I developed these prayers and I began to teach about it and I thought well you can't really go through all this with people and expose them to all this trauma without doing something about it you know and um, and finding a way through so I, I developed some prayers to renounce the them a pact and developed a ministry really of praying with people uh, doing this together really claiming freedom from this in our own lives and sometimes actually we've seen people dramatically healed it's strange <laughs> Uh, like as though there was a curse or something holding them back. But what's really exciting to me is that out of this, I've seen people uh, equipped for ministry and released into effective ministry. Um, there was a woman who reported to me from New Zealand. She'd been working amongst Muslims for more than a decade, but with little fruit. And after we prayed with her in, in a conference about this, she suddenly began to be really effective in her ministry. I prayed with a, a Coptic couple in Sydney years ago and after praying with them about this issue and breaking these curses off them, they suddenly found that for the first time in their lives, they were able to effectively witness to Muslims. And they began to lead Muslims to Christ. And they found they had a little church on their hands because of what had happened, because of a freedom that happened. And instead of their, their conversations with Muslims being dominated by Islamic apologetic agendas that would always take over, they found that the word of Christ was able to cut through and reach their hearts of the Muslims that they were speaking to. Because they'd been set free. They'd been set free. 
And I could tell you more stories about how this, uh, this process of ministry has helped release the church, set the church free. And this is greatly needed in our time. It's needed in our country because in, in America too, you have been subject to terrorism too. And the purpose of that is to impose the dhimma upon you ultimately. Bin Laden said that himself. He said the whole disagreement that we have with the West is over their refusal to either convert or to, sub to submit to the dhimma. That's the whole reason of all the terrorism. So this is actually, this pressure is part of the spiritual force that's raised up against the church in our time. And I said at the beginning that in this time we're living in an amazing period of, of Muslims coming to Christ, but I pray and I yearn that it would be a time for the church to be set free and to be released into its destiny, to be equipped to take its stand and not to fall into this structure that has been so neatly laid out for them. Like, like President Sarkozy or, or the, the, the Prime Minister of, of Britain or the President of the US, not to fall into that space that's been prepared for them by Islam. Uh, here's, a, um, uh, here's a testimony from someone who was set free. Uh, this is the woman from New Zealand. I was powerfully set free from intimidation and fear in a personal relationship. So this was in her personal life as well, after the prayer. And I've moved into a much greater effectiveness of evangelism of Muslims since praying the Dimitude prayer at your seminar. I've been reaching out to Muslims since 1989. 30 years. Over the past five years, however, since the prayer, I've been part of a community solely focused on reaching and discipling Muslims in the community, and another member of the team who was also at the seminars found far greater effectiveness in reaching Middle Eastern women after announcing vimitude. So I present this to you not just as a set of a kind of theory based on studying history, which I did with great diligence and care, but also as a, as a strategy that has had fruit and is bearing fruit in people's lives. So it stands alongside, last night I spoke about how to set people free from the, dhimma, from the Shahada Pact, what it means to be a Muslim and the curses that come with that. But now I'm speaking about how to be free from the dhimma and its implications, which is a, a deep script, a stronghold that affects the minds and hearts of so many people in the world today. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of theology and um, then we'll go through the prayer together. So Muhammad, as I explained last night, was deeply affected by rejection and he, with a wounded spirit, he imposed rejection and offense and violence and dominance on others. And his, his, his violence was driven by that spiritual condition. Jesus was rejected, but he refused to take offense. He refused to take up violence. He refused to dominate others. He refused to adopt a wounded spirit. The cross and the resurrection actually were the defeat of rejection and the defeat of the powers of darkness that, were, that are embodied in rejection. So just some points about what it means to overcome rejection, some verses of scripture. You know, when you've believed the lie, when you've had ungodly beliefs plaguing your mind space, one of the key uh, steps of being set free, apart from renouncing those beliefs, is to, is to replace them with godly beliefs, to bring godly beliefs into your world. And so when you're going through a ministry like this or you're helping someone in prayer ministry, it's good to draw them to the scriptures and remind them of the truth that God has for them. So we know uh, that, um, that God loves us. We can rely on this. So rejection is not our identity. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him or her. God loves, so loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This is actually a description of our identity in Christ. Our identity is not people fearing death. Our identity is not people living in humiliation or kind of false gratitude that's imposed on, upon us by fear. Our identity is as someone who is loved, someone who is, for whom Christ gave his life. We also have resources in the scriptures to stand against fear because God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. Fear has not come from God, but he gives us a spirit of power, love, and of self-control or a sound mind. Romans 8, you didn't receive a spirit when you believed in the gospel that makes you a slave to fear but you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him you cry, Abba, Father. Paul is saying that the Holy Spirit in your heart actually reminds you that you're a child of God, which, which gets rid of fear, because if you know you're a child of God, you're loved. There's no basis for fear to find a place in your heart. So perfect love actually casts out fear, and that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit to actually teach you that you are loved by your Father. Um, the Spirit of God also can reveal the truth to us, so we don't need to be bound by these lies that are forced upon us. 
John 16, Jesus says, unless I go away, the counselor won't come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he'll convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to us, even though our mind has been messed with in the past. We have a a real basis for asking the Lord Jesus to tell us the truth through his spirit about ourselves and about our situation. He will guide us into all truth, Jesus said. We also have authority to speak the word boldly, (laughs) the, the truth boldly. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. You know, we have authority to speak life to each other. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. 1 Corinthians 13, love doesn't delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. I've spoken about some painful things tonight, and um, I don't delight in any of the evil I've described, but I do delight that the truth is revealed, that you can understand uh, the nature of things and rejoice especially in the truth of God's love for us and the power of freedom that we have in the cross. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he is, he is in God. That's our identity. That's our true identity. Not this false identity that is forced upon us by those that want to do us no good at all. And don't throw away your confidence. You'll be richly rewarded. So in the face of these sorts of things I've been speaking about, a good wholesome response is to stand up, stand your ground and say, I am a child of God. You know, I'm not a child of fear. That's not my identity. That's not my my calling. Um, Now we can get entrapped uh, by the things I've been speaking about. We can get entrapped because of the covenants of our ancestors, because of the jizya that they paid, because of the bondage that they've been in, the curses that they've agreed to. The impacts of those curses themselves can come down generations. There can be traumatic events in our own family history, in our own background, that wreak havoc in our, in our souls. We can also make bad personal choices, and our leaders can make bad personal choices as well. This is, has an effect upon America, I believe, when its, its leader makes statements that are so ungodly in terms of responding to history. And also we can be trapped because of ignorance through lack of knowledge, just because of the darkness that surrounds our thinking about some of these issues. So there's lots of different ways that we can feel ensnared, but there's one way that we can be free, and that is to claim our freedom that Christ has won for us through the word of God that's been given to us, which is key to our freedom. Now, when we're overcome by Satan's plans, we can experience many things, hurt, fear, intimidation, self-rejection, hatred of others, depression, uh, deception, humiliation, withdrawal, isolation, silence. But we're going to take a stand against all these things. This is not who we are in God. It's what Satan wants us to be. Remember last night I said I really love this verse, which describes the humiliation of the powers of darkness and how the charge that's against us has been nailed to the cross. And so what I'd like to do tonight is invite you together with me to nail the dhimma to the cross and to declare it disgraced and humiliated and to send a message to Satan and all the powers of darkness that they have no rights against the children of God. They have only false rights. They have a false claim. And the truth is that the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than any claim that can be made against us uh, through these sort of demonic structures. We want to be people of the triumph of the cross. Uh, Jesus, when he was going off, he said, the prince of this world will be driven out, but I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So we're saying yes to being drawn to Jesus to that place of victory. Now, in order to overcome these things, it's important to speak out our freedom, to claim it. Words are really important. How we use our words is important. And what we're going to do together is agree with God that he's calling us into freedom. We're not claiming this just on our own resources. We're not saying, oh, you know, I think I ought to be free. I'll give it a go. We're saying God has called us to be free. Uh, Our freedom is our birthright. It's, It's our identity in Christ. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Salvation belongs to our God. It's his. It's, it belongs to him. And he wants to share that with us. He wants to equip us. He wants to set us free to be bold and free in the name of Jesus. And so we declare the truth and we believe the truth with our hearts. We stand against the lie that's been, stand, that's been against us and we reject it. We're going to reject it in this prayer that we say together. 
Now, people have asked, where can they find the prayers? They are in the book, Liberty to the Captives. They're also in the PDFs, which are available on the website. And I'm going to invite us to stand, and we're going to make a stand against the Dhimma tonight. And I'd love to pray for you, and I'm going to pray that fear will be broken off you, that all these kind of things I've been speaking about will not have anything to do with your identity and your calling, and that you'll be powerfully used by the Lord to take the gospel uh, to the Muslim world. You might need to come into the center or move in a little bit to make room in order to see the screen. The reason why I ask us to stand is that we are doing this wide awake alert, <laughs> you know. We're not just lying down on the couch. We're, we're, we're fully engaged in this serious matter. We'll say it's a longer prayer than last night. So here we go. Let's pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for the gift of forgiveness won by Christ on the cross. We acknowledge that you have accepted us. We thank you that through the cross we are reconciled to you and to each other. We declare today that we are your sons and daughters and inheritors of the kingdom of God. Father, we agree with you that we are not subject to fear, but are children of your love. We reject and renounce the demands of Islam. We renounce and repent of all forms of submission to Allah of the Quran and declare that we worship the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ alone. We repent of the sins of our ancestors in submitting to the Dhimma Pact and ask your forgiveness for these sins. We renounce and revoke all pacts of surrender made by our ancestors to the community and principles of Islam. We renounce the blow on the neck in the jizya payment ritual together with all that it represents. We completely reject the Dhimma and every one of its conditions. We declare that the Dhimma pact is nailed to the cross of Christ. The Dhimma has been made a public spectacle and has no right power or rights over us. We declare that the spiritual principles of the Dhimma pact are disarmed, defeated and disgraced through the cross of Christ. We renounce false feelings of gratitude to Islam. We renounce all agreements to keep silent about our faith in Christ. We renounce all agreements to keep silent about the Dhimma or about Islam. We will speak and we will not be silent. We declare that the truth shall set us free. We renounce and cancel all curses spoken against us in the name of Islam. We renounce and cancel all curses spoken against our ancestors. We specifically renounce and revoke the curse of death by decapitation. We declare that these curses have no power over us. We claim the blessings of Christ as our spiritual inheritance. We renounce intimidation. We choose to be bold in Christ Jesus. We renounce fear. We renounce the fear of being rejected. We renounce the fear of losing our property and possessions. We renounce the fear of rape. We renounce the fear of losing our family. We renounce the fear of being killed. We renounce the fear of Islam. We renounce the fear of Muslims. We renounce the fear of being involved in public or political activity. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. I submit to Jesus as Lord of every area of my life. Jesus Christ is Lord of my home. Jesus Christ is Lord of my city. Jesus Christ is Lord of my nation. Jesus Christ is Lord of all peoples in this land. We submit to Jesus Christ as our Lord. We renounce humiliation. We declare that Christ has accepted us. We serve him and him alone. We renounce shame. We declare that through the cross we are cleansed from all sin. Shame has no rights over us. We declare that we will reign with Christ in glory. We renounce alienation. We declare that we are accepted by God through Christ. We are children of God. No power in heaven or on earth can make any charge against us before the throne of God. We declare our praise and thanks to God our Father, to Christ who is our only Saviour, 
and to the Holy Spirit who alone gives us life. Now I'm going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I just declare a breaking off you all of all curses and all agreements that you've made with fear. I break them off you in the name of Jesus. And not only from Vimma, from, from Islam, but also any other curses of death that you've accepted or curses of inferiority, any bondage of uh, servitude and humiliation. I break this off you in the name of Jesus. And I say to you with all my heart, do not submit to these principles anymore. Claim your freedom and walk in freedom in Jesus' name. I also break off any of our brothers and sisters that have been ministering in the Islamic world or amongst Muslims, any curses that have come against you from ministry, any things that have been directed against you in darkness to inhibit you, to cause sickness, to cause brokenness or confusion. I break them off in the name of Jesus. They have no power to light. The scripture says that no undeserved curse can rest and we just reject all those curses in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name. And I also declare forgiveness for any ways that you might have uh, partnered with your own intimidation, any ways that you've accepted intimidation, accepted fear in your life. The Lord set you free from that. And I just encourage you to forgive yourself and not to, not to live under any bondage of shame or fear from things of the past, but to stand free in what God is calling you. I declare freedom over you, freedom of the church, freedom to speak, freedom to be bold, freedom to confess Christ, freedom to love Muslims with all your heart without restriction, freedom to stand in the, in the, in the place of truth, to declare truth to hearts that are hungry and needing that truth in Jesus' name. And I'm going to just declare words of blessing. May you receive the power of the Holy Spirit to speak words of life. I just invite you to put your right hand on your lips. In Jesus' name, bless these lips. Bless these lips with words of authority and grace to declare the truth. Words that will cut through all the rubbish and go straight to the needy heart, to the hungry heart. Words of life in Jesus' name. The Word of God. Words of hope upon your lips to bring life into dark places. To bring joy and freedom in Jesus' name. And I'm going to invite you to join with me in these last prayers. I think the one just went. Can you get on to the last slide? Is there one more slide or did I go off the very end? Okay, this is our last declaration. This is a, who we are and, and who we will be that we can declare together. Let's do this together. We commit ourselves to be living witnesses to Jesus Christ as Lord. We are not ashamed of his cross. We are not ashamed of his resurrection. We declare ourselves to be children of the living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We declare the victory of God and of his Messiah. We declare that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. 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 Praise and glory to God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. And I just sense a spirit of consecration. That God is calling people to devote their lives uh, to the gospel, to the cause of, 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 of leading people out of darkness, to bring them to the glorious light of Christ. And Holy Spirit, I just invite you to minister your holiness, your, your spirit, the spirit of consecration, of setting aside all of us now to, to the glory of the kingdom of God. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to hearts, that you would speak to them of your love for them and your, your affirmation of them, their, their identity in Christ, that you would show us what you're calling us to, that you'd give us a direction about what you're asking of us uh, for the future in Jesus' name.